Welcome, everyone, to our December 2023 Astrobiology Science Communication Guild meeting. Today, we're having Rob Zellum join us from the Science Activation Team. Sorry, not team. Uh, infra, you guys are an infrastructure group. Is that right? Or are you an actual? Right. Well, yeah, we're funded by NASA's Universal Learning, which is funded by NASA SMD. So I forget exactly what the right terminology is on that, so honestly. You're an affiliate of Universe of Learning, and Universe of Learning is a science activation team. I believe that's there we go. That's <laughs> You're part of that effort. Okay. Good um, enough. <laughs> great. So I will let you uh, take it away, Rob. Please um, introduce yourself. We'd love to know um, how you came to this project and all the sorts of um, hats you wear in terms of research and citizen science and any other um, interesting hats you wear that we may not not know about. So um, please tell us about yourself and take it away. And uh, I'm going to hand over the mic to you now. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. I really, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, so I'm Rob. I'm a staff astronomer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, and I'm talking today about Exoplanet Watch, but um, just one of the many things I work on in lab. Um, I also am in the Roman Chronographs uh, Project Science Team. So the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is Na NASA's next flagship mission that's launching no later than May of 2027. The Roman Space Telescope has two instruments on board, the Wide Field Imager, which can basically do Hubble quality science 100 to 1,000 times faster than Hubble can. And uh, the other instrument on board is the Chronograph, and that's being built here at JPL. We just finished the first round of testing last month, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and we'll be doing uh, thermal vacuum chamber testing in the spring. And the Chronograph will enable us to directly image true Jupiter analogs of uh, extrasolar planets for the first time, which is pretty exciting. Um, but one of the other hats I wear is working on this project called Exoplanet Watch, which is the citizen science project uh, to observe transiting exoplanets. So just in case uh, folks are as sleepy and caffeine deprived as I am, um, an extrasolar planet is a planet outside of our solar system. And if we're observing a host star, if we're super lucky, that star will have a planet around it. And if we're even luckier, that planet will occasionally pass in front of the host star, blocking out the star's light and causing the star to appear to dim and effectively cast a shadow all the way back here on us on Earth. And uh, the transit method is extremely important and powerful because it tells us the size of these exoplanets. The bigger the planet, the more light it blocks out from its host star, the bigger the dip. The smaller the planet, the smaller the dip. But also the transit method allows us to study an exoplanet's atmosphere. Basically when the light of the host star passes through the um, light, or sorry, the atmosphere of the exoplanet, the planet's atmosphere will absorb and scatter some of that host star's light. And if we can study how much light is absorbed and scattered by the planet's atmosphere, we can actually back out the composition of the planet's atmosphere as well. So the transit method allows us to study and characterize the atmospheres of these exoplanets. But in order to observe a transit event with something like a Hubble, a James Webb, or even an aerial, which is the European Space Agency, this is uh, their exoplanet dedicated mission. They'll be launching it in this decade they really require precise timings because if they want to observe a transit event, they have to know pretty much exactly when that transit will occur in order to minimize observing overheads. So if there's like a five or 15 minute uncertainty of when that next transit would occur, that's an extra five to 15, 20 minutes you have of overhead you have to build into your observing scenario to ensure that you hit that transit event. Um, and five or 15 minutes, you know, might not sound like a big deal, but the aerial space mission wants to observe up to a thousand exoplanets. So you, that starts to accumulate into a ton of time that um, could be wasted just waiting for these transit events to occur. Also, you want to use Hubble and James Webb as efficiently as possible because the entire community wants to use these very precious resources. And an hour of James Webb time is roughly worth anywhere from 100000 to a $1 million. So we really want to use these precious resources as efficiently as possible to help maximize their science output. So sort of thinking about this problem of we need these transit times to be known relatively precisely in order to know exactly when to get on these telescopes um, so we can use them as efficiently as possible. 
at the same time, I was getting talks like this and I was having amateur astronomers come up to me and wondering how they can get involved. And this sort of nicely dovetailed into us uh, launching this project called Exoplanet Watch. So this is getting citizen scientists involved to routinely observe transiting exoplanets to keep their transit times precise. Um, there are so many planets, hundreds, if not a thousand planets that need this monitoring by ground-based telescopes. That's literally impossible for the professional community to do it on their own. And a lot of these amateur astronomers have telescopes that are well-suited and uh, small colleges and universities as well that have um, observing capabilities that are well-suited for this campaign. We're finding that folks with telescopes as small as four and a half inches are able to make high precision observations and contribute directly to this project. And folks even in, in light polluted areas are able to get high precision observations as well. So Exoplanet Watch is a collaborative effort meant to complement existing surveys. We're uh, very friendly in collaborating with uh, the European version, if you want to call it that, of Exoplanet Watch called ExoClock. They are specifically looking to refine the ephemerities of the aerial mission target list. We're also members of the test follow-up project of SG-1 as well. Um, all of our data is immediately public. There's no proprietary phase at all. So our pipeline, which I'll talk a little bit about later, that runs every other night and our results are immediately pushed to our website. What we're really trying to do here is remove any barriers of entry into exoplanet science by removing the, the barrier of entry of needing data. All of our data is out there on the website. All of it is immediately public and anyone can go grab it and use it for their own research as well. As I'll talk a little bit more about later, we also have the opportunity for target requests by professional astronomers. Um, all of our observers will be listed as co-authors also on published works. So if you're an astronomer that has contributed data to this project and your light curve has been used in a published article for the very first time, we're asking those authors to invite you as co-authors. Because quite frankly, if you do the work, you deserve the credit for that. And as we talked about in my intro, um, we're part of NASA's Universal Learnings. So we're fully funded through them, so big shout out to them as well. As a citizen science project, we have both science and educational goals. The science goals I basically talked about before, ensuring the efficient use of large telescopes. We also have the capability, and we're starting to get more into the discovery and confirmation of new planets, and also monitoring stellar variability, which I can talk about later if you'd like. Um, we also have these educational goals as well. Very broadly, it's to engage and teach the public about exoplanets and enable them to do science. It's also about sort of inspiring that next generation of astronomers or STEM enthusiasts to pursue a, uh, a field or career in this field as well. Um, and we've been finding out that um, through this project, we've been actually having lots of student-led research and publications as well from students as young as in high school that have been leading their own first author publications by using Exoplanet Watch, its data and its data products. So this is also a really great project for undergrads uh, to get involved with, master students, even some PhD students if you'd like, um, because all of our data is completely public and we have the tools online to help facilitate their, um, their own research as well. In addition, um, a lot of you probably have hopefully access to small telescopes or it can be relatively cheap. Uh, we've priced out a, a setup that's about $1,500, which is an horrendous, um, that allows folks to fully participate in this project. But as I'll talk about in a second, we also have data for people. So if you don't have access to your own telescope, you can get data directly from us and fully participate in this project. So here's sort of like a roadmap to how someone uh, interacts as a user in Exoplanet Watch. So let's say if you do have your own observatory or you have access to a telescope or robotic telescope, you go on our website and we have a little plug in there, thanks to the Swarthmore Transit Finder, that enables you to find any transiting exoplanet that's visible in your own neck of the world um, tonight or in the future. And we have our exoplanet watch target list on there as well. And we have a ranking of priority. So you can observe our targets, but you can also observe anything that you want. We'll accept data on any exoplanet at all. Then you go out and you uh, observe with your own telescope. 
If you don't have your own scope or access to an observatory, you can also request data through us. Uh, here I have a picture of the, one of the micro-observatory telescopes. This is the Cecilia six-inch robotic telescope run by Harvard CFA in Tucson, Arizona. And this is called a micro-observatory, completely robotic, automatic telescope. And uh, this telescope has been observing transiting exoplanets for the last 10 plus years. And they very kindly have donated uh, to us over 2,000 data sets to our users. So you can actually go on our website, enter your email address, click some uh, CAPTCHA proving you're not a robot images, and then in your email inbox, you'll get delivery of some data within a few minutes. Once you have your data, either through us, through one of our uh, archival data sets, or by taking it yourself, you can then analyze your data. You could use whatever data analysis tool you want. Astro Image J is a very popular one that tons of folks use. We also have our own in-house data analysis software called Exotic that I'll be talking about in a second. Um, so you can use whatever you want to turn your raw FITS file images into a final transit light curve. After that, you upload your data to the AAVSO database. So the AAVSO is the American Association of Variable Star Observers, and they have been observing variable stars for the last 100 plus years. And they very kindly have allowed us to use their database for free to host our users' exoplanet data. and for for us to scrape it as well, to incorporate it into our database. So big shout out to the AAVSO and this amazing partnership we have with them. Then you kind of sit back, relax and get your data published. Or alternatively, since all of our data and our data products are completely open and accessible, you can just go on our website right now and use any of our data and publish your own works as much as you want. The only thing we ask in return, again, is if you use someone's data for the first time, you invite them to be co-authors on your paper, you cite our paper, and you give us an acknowledgement. So otherwise, it's a pretty low bar to enter, uh, to, to a low bar of entry to, uh, to use our data, our data products to publish your own research. So we're hoping to help facilitate research opportunities for our even high school students now and older. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about our data reduction code called Exotic. This is our exoplanet transit interpretation code. This is real astronomy software. This is literally the same exact code that I use professionally as an exoplanet astronomer that we've made accessible to everyone and anyone. You can run it in two ways. You can either run it locally on your own computer. What we really recommend is folks run it on the Google Colab Cloud. So those who are familiar with Google Colab, it enables you to run IPython notebooks or Jupyter notebooks on the Google servers. So um, Exotic runs fully on the Google Cloud. You don't have to install anything on your own computer, which makes things so much simpler. Uh, getting the right Python packages is always a pain, and getting Python installed specifically on Windows machines can also be a pain sometimes. So this really alleviates that. You just basically connect to our website and hit a few play buttons. And in as little as four minutes, Exotic will take your raw images and uh, analyze them. It'll identify the ideal comparison star, the best aperture annulus. Um, it'll do your all your calibrations, flats, biases, darks, subtractions. And it will then make a science grade light curve that you can directly copy and paste right into your own paper. Um, again, Exotic runs fully on the Google Colab Cloud. You can run this on a Chromebook or even on your smartphones. I've actually gone through the entire analysis on my smartphone as well. So you don't need a fancy high-powered computer to fully participate in this project at all. Also, we have step-by-step -step tutorials on how to use Exotic as well. So I talked a little bit earlier about our December, uh, so our professional observing campaigns. So what we'll do is we'll have some professional astronomers that will come to us and say, hey, we're about to observe this target on Hubble or James Webb. Can you help us out with some observations? And one such group came to us to observe this transiting exoplanet called HD 80606b. This is one of the most eccentric exoplanets out there, has a very, um, uh, non-circular orbit. 
So it's very interesting to study how the planet gets closer to its star and the higher insulation, insulation might change its atmospheric composition. And when the planet gets farther away, that the less insulation that might change the, uh, the composition of the atmosphere as well. But given that this has a very highly eccentric orbit, this transit takes on the order of about 18 hours to 20 hours to observe from front to back. So it's literally impossible for any single observer to get the entire transit across the world. So what we did instead is we effectively simulated a large ground global uh, spanning telescope. For example, we had some folks out in Eastern Asia, I believe in Japan, that started observing some transit uh, of this target. They then passed it off to some folks in more Central Asia and India. They then passed off their observations to folks in Eastern Europe. Uh, it looks like we got some in the Canary Islands as well. Then back to the uh, West Coast, United States, and then back to Eastern Asia again. And we were able to stitch all these individual observers' data sets together to then make a single observation of this entire planet, of this entire transit. Um, and we had about 24 facilities joining into this project. All of them were less than 0.7 meters or less than 30 inches across. Uh, and a majority of these telescopes were four and a half inches in diameter. So relatively small telescopes. And we probably had another 20 or 30 other telescopes that wanted to participate in this campaign. But unfortunately, as is tradition, when we wanted to do this campaign, most of the Northern hemisphere was completely clouded out. So this shows the power and the necessity of having a uh, widely distributed ground-based campaign because you can not only unlock the ability to observe long-term transits, long events of transiting exoplanets, but also you can help mitigate the impact due to weather because hopefully in one spot, if it might be cloudy, somewhere else might not be. Um, so, if you're interested in joining Exoplanet Watch, we'd love to have any of you participate, either as a researcher or as a mentor or a teacher. Um, you can get started here by scanning this QR code or going to our website. Honestly, the easiest way to find us, though, is just Googling NASA Exoplanet Watch, and we should be the first result that pops up. We also hosted at the beginning of this year an Exoplanet Watch workshop, which includes some tutorials and videos on how to get started in the project and how to use Exotic. Um, if you scan that QR code, I believe it'll take you to the recorded uh, video of this lecture. And also we host it on our website as well, if you want to get in touch with that and uh, use that as a resource as well. Um, in addition to the uh, micro observatory telescope that we have out uh, that our friends at Harvard CFA are very kindly still donating data to us from, we're also working on getting two telescopes out here as well. Um, installed out in the Southern California region. We have a 0.4 meter that is just now getting online, so we're a little behind schedule, unfortunately, and a 0.6 meter telescope. And we also have a seven six inch telescopes as well. So taken together, we'll hopefully have nine telescopes out here just outside of LA that'll be doing routine robotic observations of transiting exoplanets. And that will be more data that will be adding to the queue for more people to uh, use for their own research and work. So that's kind of a high level overview of Exoplanet Watch. I'm happy to pause here and see if there's any questions at all. Any questions? I've actually got a couple of questions. Um, so I'm just curious, how do you, I'm curious because I work on on a similar sort of project where I'm not working with the public on creating data sets, but I'm working with the science community on a citizen science type database sort of project. And I'm curious, um, how do you ensure fair credit and fair acknowledgement? Like, I, I understand that that's extremely important in science, but when you're working with the public and users who are sort of, you know, global, how, how do you ensure that? Yeah, um, so we explicitly write that right at the top of our website. So if you go to our results page, we have an acknowledgments and citations box at the very top to make it abundantly clear. Um, we also have it listed 
other spots of our website as well. And our we actually have a very active Slack channel where our users will keep in touch with us. And they'll let us know, like, because they want to see on our website, they want to see their publication listed on our website. So they'll let us know. And when they do, we'll remind them about our, our policy. But usually, actually, our users have been amazing about doing this on their own. So we haven't had an issue yet. And knock on wood, hopefully we won't have an issue again or ever in the future. Uh, but we try to make that as abundantly clear up front. And then when our our folks tell us about an upcoming publication, I'll just double check really quickly and make sure that they're giving the credit that's due. But honestly, our community has been super amazing and um, really supportive of each other. It's been great to see. And um, they've been wanting to, you know, get involved with each other and establish their own collaborations and, you know, uh, give the credit that's due. So it's great. Fantastic. Fantastic. So we have a question from Fallon. Fallon, I, I can read it for you if, um, if that's okay. Would it be okay to place flyers around my campus to get students involved in the exoplanet search? All right. Doing doing the SciComm <laughs> engagement right away. I'm glad. To yes, see please. That. that would be amazing. And if you uh, need anything or I have some graphics, if you want the logo as well, just uh, the best way to get in touch with me, just to email me or if you go on our website, we have a little link for, to joining our Slack channel and you can directly Slack me on there. That's the easiest way to get in touch with me. Sure. And that would be amazing. We'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and if you could drop maybe drop your email in this chat, that way, um, sure. Fallon, you you and Rob can get in touch about flyers and graphics. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I had another question. So um, I, I I imagine you're involved with a fairly large amount of um, university course course projects or in, in touch with you know faculty members who are working on this. How can you tell us a little more about that? Is is it quite a large number and what is the scope and how, what kind of, how are they using this in the classroom? Yeah, I think we've had over 20 different instructors across the world that are included Exoplanet Watch as part of the curriculum, whether it's, you know, guiding through a class or as like a lab project, or even as a sort of like an independent study research project. And they've honestly done this all themselves. We've just made our data and our tools easy to use, hopefully easy to use. And, um, and easily accessible, and they just have gone and run with it. So if you are an educator out there that wants to use this sort of part of your curricula or have some pointers or even get some materials, the best way to do that is we actually have an educator's uh, channel on our Slack workspace. And also I can put you in touch with some folks that would be more than happy to share with their, their materials with you. Very cool. Excellent. And then another message, message from Fallon. Um, she will do that next semester and she's got her um, contact info for you as well. So I'm glad I'm awesome. glad this connection was made. Um, and then, OK, we have another question. What is the best way to be part of the Slack channel? Just email. It me. is. Yeah, it's actually just uh, right on our website. So let me show you in one second. So let me screen share my browser. So I just Googled uh, NASA Exoplanet Watch. And there you go, you should be able to see it now. NASA Exoplanet Watch. And if you just click the first link that pops up. And once my computer slash internet wakes up, this always happens when everyone is just something on the involving a computer, so it's going to take forever. But right on the very front of our front page, you can see our join our Slack uh, button right here. So if you click that, it'll open up your Slack or open up in the, the browser and you can just sign up for free that way. So this is what we're using to stay in touch with our community. Um, other folks in the past have used like forums. Um, I wanted it to be sort of more of a conversation. Um, forums are great, but it kind of is asynchronous in a sense in that you might be asking a question or for help and the responses in the work through might take super long because people are, aren't able to answer immediately. The Slack is amazing because um, we can talk to our users in real time and have and work with them more quickly, more efficiently to sort of figure out their issue and hopefully resolve it as quickly as possible. Um, we also have like, you know, community building things, whether it's posting memes every Friday or having our bi-weekly meetings that are all hands and open to everyone and anyone. So we really try to keep that communication open with our users. And 
Luckily, we've been able to foster a community where other users are more than happy to help out uh, their their cohorts and their their collaborators as well. So it's not all just you know me or my team uh, sort of helping folks out. It's also our community. So really, really lucky to have an amazing user base here, and our Slack channel has been really that best way to help foster that community as well. Hopefully, that answers your question as well. I love it. Uh, community building via Friday memes. I, I want to adopt that for the guild. <laughs> what do you all think? <laughs> we should adopt some creative community building exercises via the Slack channel too. I might. <laughs> hmm, you're giving me some ideas there. <laughs> um, and I saw that you also have a, um, a newsletter too, a monthly newsletter. Yep. Uh, so folks who don't want to do the Slack or forget and close it and don't get the notifications anymore, we also have that monthly newsletter sign up as well. So we'll advertise um, our upcoming lectures that we have. So we meet about every other week on a Wednesday around 11 a.m. Pacific. We also record those meetings and we're starting to post them on our website as well. Um, so if someone happens to be in a different time zone or can't make a meeting, they can put their questions on our Slack. We'll answer them in real time in the meetings. They can watch the recordings afterwards as well. And we also have like uh, observing campaigns. We make those announcements typically in the newsletters, but also on the Slack channel as well. Excellent. Okay. Any final questions for our speaker, Rob? No. In that case, uh, to those of you who are watching this recording, I'm going to pause it now. And thank you all.